Welcome back to PACU Nursing Minutes. This week, we are going to talk about a complication in the PACU, and that is pulmonary edema. And I'm not referring to the cardiogenic type of pulmonary edema. We are going to talk specifically about post-obstructive pulmonary edema, po also known as negative pressure pulmonary edema. So come with me as I break it down. So remember, it's not cardiac origin and it is related to an obstruction. And so what happens is the patient develops a, a significant amount of intrathoracic pressure and that massive rise in intrathoracic and interpleural pressure causes um, vascular engorgement. That vascular engorgement causes pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension leads to vasoconstriction, which then eventually leads to the fluid shifting into the interstitium and into the alveoli, causing this pulmonary edema. There are two types of pulmonary edema, and primarily what you're going to see in the recovery room is a response to being intubated. Um, it's a, a acute respiratory distress that usually happens. I clinically have seen it within the first hour post extubation, but the literature says it can be up to six hours post the event. And so these obstructive events are um, classified type one is either from being intubated, uh, forceful coughing against an endotracheal tube, which is actually the most common uh, cause of pope that you will see in the PACU is somebody wasn't sedated heavily enough and then they were coughing against the endotracheal tube. Um, other causes can be choking, croup, epiglottitis, foreign body, laryngospasms, or a near drowning. Um, some of these cases, like the foreign body, the near drowning, uh, croup, epiglottitis, you may see these cases in the emergency room department. Now, type two POPE, or post-obstructive pulmonary edema, this is when somebody has had a chronic obstruction from their upper airway and lower airway, either related to gross um, adenoids or tonsils, and then they've had their tonsillectomy or the adenoidectomy um, or tumor removal that was causing this chronic obstruction. And you may see post-obstructive pulmonary edema in these cases. So um, it's not as specific to actually know these two types, um, but I want you to be aware that if you have somebody who has epiglottitis, just pack that in the back of your mind and your critical thinking, like they could develop this. Or if somebody, um, you know, just went through laryngospasms, pack that in your critical thinking um, nurse bag. So as you're assessing them over those next couple hours, just making note, they could go into flash pulmonary edema from that obstruction. So what are you going to see when they do go into this post-obstructive pulmonary edema? Well, they're going to be tachypnic. They're going to be working for their breathing, very dyspneic, uh, usually sitting up high thalers. Um, kids will be tripoding. Uh, they're going to have pink frothy sputum. Um, and hypoxic, you're gonna have trouble maintaining a sat above 90. They're gonna have this wet cough, wheezing, um, you're gonna hear rails, and they're gonna have this air hunger. And so your main goal is to give them ventilatory support. Your interventions for post-obstructive pulmonary edema are you're gonna immediately notify anesthesia. Um, you may need to call a rapid response in your PACU. Um, you're gonna give them airway support, give them 100% oxygen um, to get that sat up. Um, you may need to give them some non-invasive ventilation through a BiPAP. Uh, for a period of time, or if they're really in distress, you may actually have to go all the way to intubating and ventilatory support for a period of time. These patients usually do respond very well to supportive care, and it usually is self-limiting within 24 to 36 hours. Um, your doctors may order a stat chest x-ray, which is going to show pulmonary vascular congestion, um, and uh, they may order some diuretics, um, or even albumin, albumin that can uh, help 
with managing by giving an osmotic effect and pulling the fluid back into the intervascular space from the interstitium. And then you may need to also do hemodynamic support, supporting their blood pressure. They may be hypotensive during this crisis. So you're definitely going to need to get some extra hands on deck. And <laughs> unfortunately, uh, well, sometimes these incidents, you know, they seem to happen on the weekends or on the nights and uh, you, you need extra resources when this happens because it's immediate respiratory ventilatory support for these patients. Uh, here are my references and as always, thank you for tuning in to PACU Nursing Minutes. I am Nurse Kathy. Um, this channel is for education and knowledge sharing. Always follow your hospital's policy and procedures, your physician's orders, and your nurse practice act. Thank you for tuning in to PACU Nursing Minutes. I'm Nurse Kathy. If you feel like I'm giving you value added to your practice, then please subscribe, share it with your friends, colleagues, and drop me a line. I'd love to hear from you.